Our next speaker, Doug Zadonis, is the Executive Vice President of the UNM Health Sciences Center. Dr. Zadonis joined UNM just eight months into the pandemic, and he not only led us through a difficult period, but has been a constant supporter of ECHO along the way. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Doug Zadonis. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this 20th anniversary for Project ECHO and the Meta ECHO Conference. I wish you could stand where I am and see what a great audience this is here and all your colleagues. Let's give each other a hand. I am so thrilled and honored to be part of this important event that brings all of you from around the world, whether you're in the hybrid, hello out there, or you're here in the room, it's so great for us to be present. Uh, when I first came here to work at UNM, Bob Dylan was hanging out on the stage, singing in front of everybody. So it's kind of cool to be where Bob Dylan was. And the real Bob Dylan is coming up soon. He's called Dr. Sanjeev Arora. So we are all here because of our common commitment and goal to make a difference in health and health equity in our local communities and all around the world. I want to thank President Stokes. She's always inspiring, a terrific leader here at the University of New Mexico. She supports us in our health and health equity agenda. You get it, President Stokes. Thank you for your leadership. I want to thank uh, Admiral Levine. I'm a Penn State Medical School graduate, so woo! Uh, but what great inspiration. You know, I wish I could be able to announce a nationwide HHS, Environmental Justice Community Innovator Challenge. But sadly, I will only be able to say a few humble words. As CEO of the University of New Mexico's health system and executive vice president of our health science, which is our medical school, colleges of nursing, pharmacy, public health, health professions, and our research programs, every day I see and listen to the needs of our community regarding health and health equity, as well as the amazing responses and engagement that our faculty, staff, students, volunteers make in all our mission strategic priority areas, whether it's clinical, or research, our education, our public health, our community engagement, or inclusive excellence. Together, we are able to use our creativity and compassion in making a difference to learn from one another. We also have important pathway programs. I think all of us need to think about the next generation. We're in the room trying to make a difference, but how do we get the students in elementary school, junior high, high school, make sure they have enough of the STEM training needed, make sure they have enough compassion training, mindfulness training to be able to make a difference as they appreciate the impact of the world, they are going to be dealing with climate change in a more profound way than we've had to. But we're seeing uh, the opening of that window. Of all the creative ideas I've seen, Project ECHO is one of those diamonds, making a difference here in New Mexico and across the world. It started with a simple idea by a humble doctor who was caring and compassionate for his patients, who was frustrated by the system we've created that people in rural areas couldn't get equal health care. He witnessed those health inequities. He saw people die because of those health inequities. I love whenever he tells the stories. 
The Project ECHO team responded, because remember, the beginning of the movement is not the first crazy da guy dancing, it's everyone else following the crazy da guy dancing. And he's been able to think of how do we adapt this to different cultures, to different settings, to different traditional healing approaches, and we do that as a team effort. There isn't one cookie cutter, even though there is evidence-based practice. And there's evidence-based practice in the communities that we haven't studied yet to know that there are evidence around it. So thank you, Dr. Aurora, for your leadership and your humanity. I'm not the only one who thinks you truly deserve a Nobel Prize for what you have done and how you have built teams everywhere to make a difference. But thank you to the Project ECHO team. Let's give them a hand. This is truly bi-directional learning. All teach, all learn. Uh, we, uh, last year I had a health equity summit. You can Google UNM Health Equity Summit and you can learn about what we did. We had listening tours all over our big state in the communities with the faith-based uh, 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 leaders, with uh, prematuras, with legislators, with teachers, with patients. And from that, we created 12 labs that they cared about. It was a ground up health equity summit. I think you'd be intrigued to look at what topics were the 12 labs that they picked. My own clinical background is as a physician and a public health specialist who's focused on improving mental health and well-being and supporting communities, families, and individuals as they struggle with addiction, which has profoundly affected our communities. Whether it's working in prisons, healthcare settings, or in the community, on the streets, there's a great need for bi-directional learning and getting evidence-based practice into our re routine practice. I've learned so much from so many different views on how to address addiction from the recovery community. Remember, AA was around way before physicians decided this was important to address as a medical problem. So we can learn so much from the recovery community, people with lived experience, and what they bring. <clears throat> this morning I was able to talk to many of you, and I was combing the posters, for those of you who have already put one up. So I want to acknowledge two that I noticed. One was on opiate use disorder recovery. The lessons learned that are in that poster, I hope you all get a chance to see it. Talking with others at the desk uh, around the breakfast of how they're going to bring trauma-informed care into their communities, starting with the greeter at the door and all providers. Working in addiction helped me learn from people with lived experience, peer specialists, community health workers, promotoras, community healers, as well as pharmacologists, psychologists, neuroscientists, and healthcare workers. People in Alcoholics Anonymous and other mutual support groups have brought to healthcare a recovery language and approach that helps us all in mental health care. I was uh, lucky to be on President Bush's New Freedom Commission and that focused on how do we bring recovery language and wellness into healthcare. Project ECHO uh, is also recognizing the need to understand the root causes. We've got an introduction into that around the social determinants of health, the impact of childhood maltreatment, lack of basic needs, decades of multi-generational trauma, the impact of poverty, limited education, transportation, broadband, and much more. ECHO is now having learning communities that focus on public safety, homelessness, gender equity, education, environmental justice. Project ECHO is truly transforming our health systems. We also need to do dissemination and implementation science work, and I know a number of you are. It's not just about training. We really have to change our systems. What's going to sustain the education that we provide? ECHO is all over New Mexico in our rural areas, in our inner cities. New Mexico is about 
two-thirds the size of California, and yet a population about half of one of its cities, San Diego. So we have a large rural area, long distances, and ECHO uniquely helps. Just yesterday, I was talking to a number of legislators and community folks who really appreciate what's happening in this state. And now we need patients and families and communities to also recognize this. How do we bring ECHO to the patients? ECHO is in over 195 nations in the world and growing. My parents immigrated from Latvia. So when I first came here, I said, Sanjeev, is Latvia part of the ECHO network? He put his head down a little and said, I don't know anybody in Latvia. I said, well, I do. So now we have a partnership with Riga Stradens University, the major academic health center of Latvia. And so uh, I'm excited that we're up to 195. It's all over the world, and it's really amazing to think about it. Uh, but today, I must also recognize today the founder, Dr. Sanjeev Arora, who will be speaking next. He started it all. He has mobilized ECHO's vast, trusted human network to face down an unprecedented global pandemic through improving care and understanding in nursing homes and far beyond. Today, with so many, we are meeting critical needs in local communities. Uh, Sanjeev and I have countless conversations every morning waking up, how are we going to reduce health equity? And how are we going to improve health? <laughs> I thought I had a lot of energy, but his tireless energy is really amazing and makes a difference. So it is with great humility and honor that I am able to introduce Dr. Sanjeev Arora, my friend, my colleague, the amazing leader for Project ECHO, the future Nobel Prize winner, who started a movement and continues to generously share his revolutionary idea wherever it's needed. Please join me. Let's all stand up and welcome Dr. Sanjeev Arora. Thank you, and uh, good morning. You know, welcome to New Mexico. It's so good to see you all. I am just overwhelmed by the friendship, the collegiality, and really all of you who have come from far-flung corners of the world, from Vietnam to Namibia to Zambia, to Canada, to Australia. We have all the continents represented and really appreciate your all coming, coming here. I also want to thank the team. There has been an amazing effort by the ECHO Institute team to host you here. And so I'm going to just request this team who've been involved in putting up this conference to just stand up, because I think that I want to express my gratitude to them. Without them, this would not be occurring. They put it all together so we can spend this, these four days together. So please join me in giving me a hand. Please stand up, the ECHO team. So this week is about celebrating what you have accomplished over the past 20 years. It's about reflecting on our work together and looking forward. Together, we will set goals for the ECHO movement to learn what we want to accomplish as a community. When we were together in person in March of 2019, who would have thought it would be four and a half years before we would meet again? Look at that picture. Don't we look great? <laughs> but you're going to have to do a lot more dancing on Wednesday evening to look better than that. This week, we are expecting 1,000 attendees in person and another 1,000 online, making this the largest MetaEcho conference ever. And I'm grateful to each of you for the time you have set aside to be part of this discussion over the next few days. 
your presence here virtually and in person meets, means a lot to me and to the entire ECHO Institute team. I also want to express my gratitude to our speakers this morning. First, President Stokes, who you have heard from a, th a few moments ago, and exec Executive Vice President Dr. Zidon is my boss, and you can see how his mission is aligned with our own mission. He's all about health equity. That's what he talks to me day and night. I get calls from him at 9.30 in the night. Talk, when he wants to talk about health equity. Project ECHO would not be where it is today without the support of the University of New Mexico and our Health Sciences Center. Thank you, Dr. Zidonis. Thank you, President Stokes. I also want to thank Admiral Levine for joining remotely and sharing her passion and support for our community. I've had the opportunity to meet with the Admiral several times over the past few years. I so admire her leadership and commitment to health equity. I know health equity is in her heart. She and her team are working tirelessly to ensure that all the people in the U.S. have access to health care they need, when they need it, no matter who they are. Let's first reflect back on where we've been. Then we look forward into the future. It's my hope that what I share today can spur dialogue over these next few days. As most of you have heard me say, hopefully you can forgive me if this is the thousandth time you heard it. 20 years ago, New Mexico had a big problem to solve, how to get hepatitis C treatment to the state's 28,000 people who were infected and desperately needed care. And we developed a very simple solution, the ECHO model. As the model gained traction, the idea was also born that we could teach others to use ECHO. We could democratize our knowledge of how to do ECHO and even more, give away our tools and expertise as quickly as possible to as many organizations as possible. Doing this, we thought we would change the world. People like John Scott at the University of Washington, Terry Box at the University of Utah, Daniel Johnson at the University of Chicago, Sandy Root Elledge at University of Wyoming, Kumud Rai and Sunil Anand at Echo India, inspired me in those early days of this journey. Many more of you have inspired me in the years since. What has struck me is that many of you have joined the ECHO community for the same values. We share the same values. You want to change the world and make a difference. And you're compassionate and loving and want to help your communities. And you have a strong desire to learn, innovate, and be intellectually challenged. I'm very grateful for this community and humbled to be part of this group. 20 years ago, I could never have imagined what this movement would become. So thank you. Thank you again for being here and for being a part of this amazing journey. Thank you. Of the past 20 years, the last three and a half for me have been the most challenging. For all of us, this has been a difficult and unusual time. We have all lived through a once in a century global pandemic. Many of us have suffered the unspeakable loss of loved ones, fathers, mothers, spouses, and friends. Others have had to figure out how to teach math at home when schools suddenly closed, and still others had to navigate caring for a young baby while hosting a Zoom call for work. Nearly all of us in this room shared the challenges of shifting our work overnight. I suspect many of you can identify with what we experienced here in New Mexico. In mid-March 2020, as our team was transitioning to work from home, we quickly made the decision to pause most ECHO programs, to focus on the immediate COVID response. And within a month, we were running more than 10 programs. Everything was changing quickly, and we had no choice but to keep up. In the first 18 months of the pandemic alone, there were 200,000 peer-reviewed publications on COVID. How could an individual in rural New Mexico 
or a busy clinician in New Delhi possibly keep up on their own without a trusted human network to help support and guide them? It's no ex exaggeration to say it would have been impossible. In those early days, we were contacted by key federal agencies tasked with leading the COVID response in the US. I remember so vividly conversations with government officials like the late David Myers, who we will honor later this week, and Mamta Pancholi, who's here with us today at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. AHRQ was looking for a scalable way to reach frontline nursing home staff where they were and connect them with local resources and expertise and they found it in your network. Over just five months in partnership with AHRQ, more than 100 organizations, which we call hubs, successfully launched 343 weekly echo networks, supporting over 9,000 nursing homes and training more than 32,000 unique participants. These were employees of these nursing homes. This was the largest single project in ECHO's history. And through this partnership and all your help, we believe we saved thousands of lives. And at ASPER, another federal agency, this is the HHS agency leading emergency preparedness and response, Rick Hunt, who's here with us today, worked closely with us and other experts across the country to quickly stand up a massive community of practice. That community became in many parts of the United States and the world the place to go for quickly evolving best practices and treatment options. The World Health Organization also partnered with us in an amazing effort to support in creating communities of practice to address the pandemic. These programs benefited public health program managers, policy makers, and frontline health workers in more than 230 countries and territories. More than 178,000 attendances were logged. And Haney Utinen, who is here with us, will talk more about this initiative later. Thank you, Haney, for coming all the way from Switzerland. Overall, the ECHO community launched more than 1,300 networks just to support the COVID-19 response. I am so proud of all your contributions to help our communities respond and reduce deaths and suffering. Tens of thousands of lives around the world were saved and suffering reduced because of your hard work and dedication. I really applaud you for this effort, for rising to the occasion for something so unplanned. In the presentations this week, you will hear from colleagues who stepped up to help their communities. They used existing and new ECHO networks to provide support to frontline workers around the world. I want to challenge us all to capture the key learnings from the com ECHO community's response. This can help us develop systems to be better prepared for future public health emergencies and global crises. Our partners at government agencies and the WHO really went the extra mile to dream big and work collaboratively to meet the scale of the challenge. A lesson for me in those early days was that visionary leadership in government and multilaterals like David, Mamta, Rick, Haney provided can have transformative impact. Before the pandemic, global and national agencies relied on in-person training once a quarter or once a year. This emergency required a huge paradigm shift in thinking about how best to train, mentor, and support frontline workers efficiently and effectively at scale. Over the past three and a half years, participation in ECHO programs around the world has grown exponentially. Today, we have over 2 million unique learners in 195 countries. Interest in adopting the ECHO model has grown dramatically as well. In March of 2020, we had 380 hubs in our network. Today, 
1,080 organizations across the globe have adopted the ECHO model. These include major universities, ministries of health, associations, and international NGOs. Our expanding network of super hubs, hubs that have stepped up to train others on the ECHO model has been a key to this growth. Through our work together, we have demonstrated that the ECHO model has unique properties. It's virtual, bringing together experts and frontline professionals to focus on problem-solving real cases. And it all works within a culture of all teach, all learn, trust and mutual respect and caring. These unique properties allow for an adaptable human response to major events such as pandemics, natural disasters, and even war. I like to say that it is not knowledge that makes ECHO work. It is love and respect and empathy and kindness and community. Behind each of these five million attendances are frontline professionals who have been mentored. And for every nurse, doctor, or community health worker you, who participates in ECHO, there are hundreds of people who benefit from their participation. And our growing body of research continues to demonstrate our impact. To date, we have 563 peer-reviewed publications, including 83 that demonstrate strong patient outcomes, and nine showing outcomes at the community level. I hope each of you will take a few minutes to attend the session on research and evaluation this week and engage in the discussion about metrics, impact, and outcomes. We are all part of this research team. We have come a long way, but we still have a, so much more to do. As we think about how the work of the last 20 years was accomplished, it was because each of you believed that you could have exponentially greater impact by democratizing your expertise. There are so many amazing, life-changing stories of people right here in this audience. Echo is changing lives the lives of participants and end beneficiaries, and just as notable of our experts and leaders. I want to share two stories that epitomize for me what a, motiv what a mid motivated individual and a small, dedicated team can do to make a massive difference in the world. Yesterday, I was practicing this speech in front of my wife, and she said, focus on stories. So here they come, guys. <laughs> the first person I want to tell you about is Kristen Sol. That's her in Vietnam. <laughs> Dr. Sol is a pediatrician based in Columbia, Missouri. I met Kristen eight years ago. For those of you who have had the opportunity, you know that meeting Kristen Sol is like meeting a whirlwind, a force of nature. Very early on in our conversations, she articulated an amazing vision, a vision of all kids in Missouri, the US, and globally, having access to timely and affordable screening and treatment for autism. You know that if you diagnose autism late, it has devastating effects. Diagnosing it very early changes the natural history of the disease. I was simply blown away by her global vision. And she had decided the ECHO model was going to be her vehicle to scale that vision. First, she led a group of universities to launch eight national ECHO programs. Then she built a meta-ECHO community of hubs and experts sharing ideas about evaluation, research, and best practices. She has traveled globally to spread ECHO autism to South Africa, Vietnam, Canada, Central America, and many other places. And today, as a result of her efforts, there are 97 echo autism programs operating in 15 countries. I also want to tell you about Nada Fadul, an infectious disease doctor at the University of Nebraska. Nada first learned about the echo model because she was participating in the nursing home project. 
While her initial work on ECHO was focused on Nebraska, the real challenge she was facing was how to help her colleagues and community back in her home country of Sudan. In 2021, NADA helped launch a community medical response ECHO run by medical students in Sudan. Trained virtually, these teams of young professionals set up vaccination sites across the country. Not only did they reduce the spread of infection, but they also created a virtual community of practice, linking experts from around the world with an eager audience on the ground in Sudan. This year, when civil war erupted, a strong network of mentored healthcare professionals and volunteers was able to take advantage of the infrastructure, the echo railroad tracks that had been built and pivot to ensure that emergency medical care and ongoing health needs were provided in communities across the country. This is Hadil, a medical student in Sudan. Wearing a garbage bag as a surgical gown, she's caring for a patient with a bullet wound. She's being supported by ECHO. NADA has been working around the clock with community health leaders on the ground throughout this crisis. Using the ECHO model, they have trained over 12,000 healthcare workers in Sudan to provide acute and chronic care during emergencies. And NADA and her team are thinking about the beyond the immediate crisis, launching ECHO to help with peace building, leadership research, leadership research, and to train teachers how to help end the cycle of violence plaguing the country. As I said, there are so many stories that I could include here. What impresses me most about these stories is the bold vision Kristin, Nada, and their teams identified to solve these huge problems and the strategic way they have used ECHO to help scale their impact. Let's take a moment to pause and celebrate these two individuals and all the other leaders in the ECHO network for their contributions to make the world a better place. After 20 years of ECHO, what comes next? Where should we point our collective efforts and skills? How can we work even more collaboratively to maximize our impact? In healthcare, we know what many of the key challenges are. Frontline healthcare workers are burnt out. Our systems are designed to treat disease and not prevent it. Information is increasing at an even faster pace than when ECHO began 20 years ago. And yet, our trust in that information is an all-time low. Profit motives sometimes divert us from a singular focus on patient health, families, and health equity. The ECHO model cannot solve all these challenges that are facing healthcare in the US and everywhere in the world. But I would argue that the programs you and this audience run every day embody many of the interventions needed to address these challenges. Continuing to scale this work can make a big difference. ECHO reduces the time it takes for new knowledge to reach the last mile of healthcare. We improve access to specialty care, producing equity for underserved populations. ECHO helps frontline professionals, professionals feel connected in a broader community, building provider resiliency, and most of all, the model of all teach, all learn helps reduce power differentials and creates contextually appropriate solutions. I believe that by expanding our programs and embedding ourselves even further into health systems, we can all, you can be a force for change. In addition to doing more programming to support health systems in the US and globally, I want to challenge all of us to consider starting ECHO programs in new areas. One of the things you have all taught me is that the ECHO model can play a key role in addressing the social determinants of health far beyond traditional healthcare. In fact, your experiments with the model 
have convinced me that at its core, echo is the ideal way to structure an ongoing conversation and build a community to solve problems and grow expertise. At a fundamental level, echo is domain agnostic. It's about upskilling a workforce and finding contextually relevant solutions that work for local practitioners and that work for local community needs. In New York this week, the United Nations General Assembly is going on and global leaders are reviewing our progress towards the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, also called SDGs. And we are not doing well. I believe there are at least nine of the SDGs, such as education, gender equity, livelihoods, clean water, climate change, which impact health, where we can make the most difference. For all these areas, there is a workforce of frontline professionals who need ongoing mentorship and support to be efficient and effective at their jobs. So far in this conversation, I focus mostly on ECHO's work in healthcare. But many of you in this audience have been pioneers in bringing ECHO to exciting new spaces. Prison peer educators, legal aid, K through 12 education, higher education, training for judges, climate change, and so much more. The ECHO India team has just accepted the challenge from the government of India to train and mentor 600,000 workers in the water sector to provide access to clean drinking water for the 1.4 billion people of India. <laughs> to me, this work of echo outside of healthcare is the next frontier. We want to test and explore whether the echo model's flexibility and resiliency and efficiency can be of use beyond healthcare. The areas adjacent to healthcare seem the most promising. For example, education and health are closely connected. A child who cannot read has lower earning potential over their lifetime. They cannot effectively advocate for their health, and they may not have the tools to make healthy choices. They have a significantly lower life expectancy. Our education team here in New Mexico, along with Wyoming, in Echo India, Arizona State, Oklahoma State, and many others, including Nigeria, have been building Echoes for education for several years. In many ways, teachers are at least as isolated as healthcare professionals. They need and deserve ongoing mentorship and support. I believe in the long term that these programs will have bigger impact on humanity than Echoes for Healthcare. And I'm making an ask of you today. Go back to your states and countries and have dialogue with your departments of education to bring Echo for K through 12 education in your schools. The UN SDGs are broad and many, but if we focus on a few key areas where we can have the biggest impact with the highest return on investment, we can make a massive difference. A group of more than 100 economists and experts based in Stockholm have been tracking the SDGs and researching which investments would make the most difference in helping the global community attain its goals. In other words, which investments will provide the biggest lever to drive change? This research provides a roadmap for where ECHO can, programs can be the most effective. As an example, the Stockholm group finds that investment in treating patients with tuberculosis can have huge health benefits. Take this example a little further. 4,000 patients die of TB every day in the world. Generic medicines and easy testing is available. A small investment 
can save these lives. A few simple interventions such as teaching young women to take prenatal vitamins and ensuring local teams know how to resuscitate a newborn can make a huge difference in maternal and infant mortality. A global campaign to vaccinate all children for HPV has the potential to eliminate much of the global burden of cervical cancer and save hundreds of thousands of lives. There are many high leverage areas like this where Project ECHO can make a difference. A final area I would like to touch on is gender equity. I'll confess that for me, this is not an area that was really on my radar until a few years ago. But becoming a grandparent gave me the opportunity to see 21st century parenting through the lens of my two daughters. Seeing their journeys gave me a deeper understanding of the many ways the professional world and society at large has been set up to privilege men. In the last year or so, gender equity has become a major focus for us. As you will hear today and throughout this conference, we have challenged ourselves to explore how the ECHO model can change the world dramatically for women and girls across their lifespan. I invite you to join us in this exploration this book, this week. Reading the book Half the Sky, which I recommend to all of you, by Cheryl Wudan and Nicholas Kristof, was another key event on my journey to understand how focusing much more on the needs of women and girls can change the world dramatically. I was so impressed by the book, I bought enough copies that everyone in Echo could get a copy to read it. I'm excited that Cheryl, the author, is here today to share with us her wisdom and vision in this important area. I've laid out an ambitious agenda for us, and I know many of you are thinking, we can't do this all. The programs are so big, and the resources are scarce, and you're asking us to do not only healthcare, but to consider expanding in other areas far beyond. Well, you know, I believe that if we don't think big and audaciously, we will never reach our full potential. You are an amazingly empowered group. You can change the world, and that's why I'm asking each of you to dream big, really big. But I'm also thinking about how can we make this a little easier for you. For many years, we've been working on how best to leverage technology to make us more impactful, efficient, and effective. How can technology help us all to build our virtual communities of practice more efficiently? How can we capture data and evaluation metrics that can make it easier to show impact and raise funds for our programs? About 10 years ago, we partnered with an up-and-coming startup called Zoom to be able to make Zoom video conferencing available to our partners at no cost. I went to see Eric Wan in 2013. I told him, you know, I want to help a billion people. I think he thought I was crazy. And I said, what I want from you is a global world license that I can give away these licenses to my partners. And guess what? He said, yes. And this has been an enormous tool for Echo to scale globally. We are still a proud partner with Zoom, and on behalf of all of us, I want to extend our gratitude to Eric Wan, to Zoom, and Heidi West, who is here with us today, for their generosity of spirit. You know, they have shown us that how a very, very profitable business can also have such enormous social conscience. Thank you. For the past couple of years, here at the ECHO Institute and at ECHO India, we've been working hard 
to build systems that use technology to help all of us do our jobs better. The latest version of our iEcho software is the result of that effort. And I can promise you, it's a game changer. We have 400 hubs who are already using it, and the feedback is simply amazing. But we all know, ultimately, technology won't change the world. People will. Our trusted human networks remain the driver of everything we do. Can we imagine a world where every frontline worker is connected to a community of practice that helps them hone and acquire new skills for greater impact? A world where all best practice implementation is democratized for equity and contextualized to meet local needs. Imagine the impact we could have. We've always said that we wanted to, to touch one billion lives, and we are well on our way. But I'm thinking now, seriously, that we may be too conservative. Six billion people in the world don't have the right knowledge at the right place at the right time. We need to help them all. I want to challenge us to do even better, to strive for more. Which brings me back to where we started. You, the people in this room, and the people on Zoom. The entire global echo community. You are the power. You are the power behind this movement. And together, we can change the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.